one of the concerns is primarily what rights have you got in terms of filming, photographing in public, reporting public incidents, uh, what happens when it goes wrong, and how do you get out of it? So it's a little bit about think like a criminal, can I do it, if so how, how do I protect myself and how do I get out of this if there's a problem? And from my perspective, the concern with you as students is protecting you and your interests, actually. That's the main concern that we have. And a lot may depend upon what capacity you're working in. So there are ways in which you can protect yourself when you're involved in public filming, etc. One of the obvious things, of course, is carrying identification. And if you are a member of an organisation such as the NUJ, press organisation, carrying confirmation of that. If you've got student cards which show that the course that you're doing, good idea to carry that. Because often the issue is, is this person bona fide? Is this person uh, going to be a problem or being a problem? Um, the other thing is that if you're going to be going out filming in public areas and there may be concerns, for example, you're knowingly putting yourself in an at-risk situation, um, good idea to have at least two of you so that you've got somebody there if things go wrong who is actually witnessing what happens. And most of the time if you're using film, that's of course your first port of keeping information. Uh, nothing at all wrong in a public place with carrying a dictaphone with you if you think that's appropriate. I've had more than one incident where police have uh, found themselves in a less than pleasant position in court when it's transpired that proceedings have been recorded. And you may benefit from uh, having facilities, for example, if you're considering downloading imagery, etc. Now, there's a, I'd like to be able to suggest to you that if you haven't done anything wrong, you won't be stopped, you won't be searched, and you won't be arrested. But sadly, that's not the case, because, of course, what the police are doing is, um, if it's the police we're talking about, which it's not always, we may have security guards, PCSOs, etc. But mainly the police that we'd be talking about. And in terms of what they can and can't do, what triggers them being able to take action, sometimes you don't have to have done anything. I don't think I've ever yet, well very, very few times, actually represented somebody who thought they were going to be arrested. This is not what people expect to happen, especially if you're normal law-abiding people who don't normally get into trouble. But if you have a situation where, for example, one or a number of police officers who are people just the same as you or I are, who get concerned about the situation and the adrenaline's flowing and they actually don't know who are the good guys and who are the bad guys or who are the good girls and who are the bad girls, who's doing what. So a lock, stock and barrel approach. Seen it in respect to football matches, worldlings may end up in being arrested. Seen it in respect to Stonehenge actually. Going back over 20 years I was involved in one of the big arrests at Stonehenge where the police introduced temporary provisions that two or more people could constitute a procession. Now, I don't know if any of you would struggle with that concept. I think most of us probably would cons struggle with the idea that two people walking together as a procession. But no, they managed to bring that in as a temporary measure and arrested over 200 people who were innocently trying to get their way to Stonehenge. Not knowing what to do with them all, they dumped them all in uh, Devizes Police Station, which was the headquarters, and the only place they got was the gym. So they stuck them all in the gym. And then problems started to arise as one or two of them said, I'd like to see a solicitor, please. And they were then stopping those people going back in because, of course, they didn't want them to suggest that to anybody else. But um, the concern is how, how do you protect yourselves? What may happen? And if problems arise, obviously it helps you to know what your rights are, what your options are, and how you get help if you need it. Now, photographers, most of you are photographers. I found a really handy little website. Um, it's called At Urban 75 and it's um, mo much of the material I'm going to be using this afternoon comes from there because it's just extremely useful. It's well set out, it's got separate pages for relevant issues. So that's At Urban 75, that's been updated, well, it says updated December 09, so it's a little bit out of date, but some of that provision's clearly been updated last year. So, um, and that's specifically about photographers' rights street shooting, people, privacy and children. So a useful source of information. Other useful sources of information, of course, the Direct Gov website, which is the government website, which has got all sorts of bits of information on it, but it's usually brief, to say the least. Um, 
In terms of texts, I've, I can uh, make reference to a textbook on civil liberties and human rights, which make sure you get up-to-date editions if you get books, because the law is changing all of the time. Our last government brought in over 4,000 new criminal offences. So there's a lot going on. Keep up to date is the golden rule. Um, but that Richard Stone's book on um, civil liberties and human rights textbook on has been quite a useful source. A lot of the other books probably aren't. Uh, in terms of possible offences you might get mixed up in, we usually use uh, a text called the Magistrates Court Guide, Anthony Berriman's, which is a very useful, noddy guide of, of different criminal offences that you might get mixed up in by accident. But photographers write, you want to go out filming or photographing a public incident. Can you do it? Usually the short answer to that is absolutely. You've got a right to go out into public places and take photographs. And there are things you need to bear in mind. One of those, of course, is copyright. You will know, I'm sure, it must have been drilled into you. If you're filming things or taking photographs of things that might be subject to somebody else's copyright, obviously you make sure that the predominance of it isn't somebody else's work, and if it is, you credit it. But in the normal course of events, you can go into public places and take people's photographs, and you've got a right to do so. You can film in most public places. There are things that you need to keep in mind when you are doing that. One of those, of course, is the right to privacy. Article 8 of the Human Rights Act, Rights Act gives people a right to privacy. But actually, that doesn't stop you taking a photograph if they're out in public places. If you behave in a way whereby it is clear that you are taking photographs of a private situation, which is clearly meant to be a private situation, and you are therefore effectively intervening in somebody else's privacy, obstructing that in some way, in a, in a very real way, then there is the risk that you could find yourself um, obviously being asked to stop. The journalism students amongst you will be familiar with the concepts of what we call breach of confidence. Uh, there are particular cases where that's been highlighted. Douglas and Helen uh, magazine was one when Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta Jones got themselves married. Photographs taken of a private place, their wedding, they had clearly made it, uh, they'd stopped people taking cameras in, and somebody uh, sneaked a camera in, took photographs, and sold them. And that was clearly both an invasion of privacy. In fact, the paper argued, well, how are they private? They're about to sell into a magazine. It's going to be published all over the place. But it was also found that they had a effectively a financial interest in the protection of their private property the photographs. So um, that was one of the main cases. The other, of course, a uh, case of Naomi Campbell, 2004, and MGM uh, against the newspapers. And she um, was photographed particularly coming out of a drugs rehab centre, and there was a lot of discussion about whether her privacy had been invaded, whether she was in a situation where one could expect privacy to be respected and uh, there were issues concerning the fact she'd held herself out as being drug free and not getting involved in activities such as that and there was a certain amount of leeway allowed, some photographs could be taken but um, at the, when the point comes when you are clearly intervening in somebody's private event and in that case it was felt there had been too extensive an intrusion not appropriate. There's also, I think it's fairly well um, documented with a whole series of cases that if you take photographs of people where they are clearly involved in privacy, for example, long angle lenses of people on private property, again, you can expect yourself potentially facing court action in respect to that. 